This video is part two of a playlist series I've titled Post Messianic Millennium Hope. Yes, that's hope for most of humanity to have an opportunity for eternal life. And this is after the 1,000 year reign of the Messiah and his first resurrection, also known as first fruits, here on earth. After that 1,000 years, there's going to be more resurrections offering hope not just all condemnation so picking up where i left off in part one of this playlist series i will now begin sharing my slide with you as an overall title of this playlist again is post messianic millennium hope and this is playlist video number two as i've titled resurrections room for interpretations Yes, there's some room for interpretations, can't be overly dogmatic about the future and prophecies and just go by what we feel is revealed to us. And then so I'm going to be sharing my spiel with you on how I understand these scriptures and this chronological order, plan of salvation through the annual holy days, the biblical ones, of course. But first of all, before diving into this metaphoric devar, is the Hebrew word for word, or devarim, that the Yud and the Mem suffix makes it plural, like we translate Devarim into Deuteronomy for the book of Deuteronomy. And that was Moshe's last words or his last sermon. And the book is titled Deuteronomy. But here, looking at the Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2, it, we got to remember this when it comes to ambiguous difficulty, trying to understand the scriptures. He designed it this way. It is the glory of Elohim to hide the truth, to conceal these. It says a matter is the way the New King James puts that word there. The Strong's Hebrew word 1697 is devar, and it can mean a word or an implication, a matter, a spoken thing, but it's referring to hiding the truth within words. Words being difficult to understand, not intending to be easy, like an allegory or a parable or a metaphor and, and so forth. But it says here, notice the tail end of this verse, it says, but it is the glory of kings. We know the Messiah is going to be the king of kings, and we're called to be this royal priesthood. Uh, not just Levi, the Levitical priesthood, but there's a Melchizedek priesthood I've given a video YouTube teaching on. To be kings of kings and lord of lords is what the Messiah will be. And so it is the glory of us who want to be under him in leadership. Also called to leadership to search out the matters, to search out these truths that are hidden in the words of the holy scriptures, the inspired scriptures, the word of Yah. So putting that as a stamp into our memory banks as we dive into this metaphoric terminology in the book of Revelation, especially as I title this slide page, Resurrections, Room for Diverse Interpretations, of course. Yes, but this is post-millennium, post-messianic millennium, resurrections. And, and the key scriptures, the foundation scriptures uh, for this teaching are in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15 here. It says, then I saw a great white throne. It's not a terrible white throne or just a condemnation throne of judgment, but it's a great white throne. White is symbolic of righteousness. And as King David wrote in the Psalms, be whiter than snow. <laughs> How do you get whiter than snow? Unless it's been tainted, of course, but nevertheless, what well, snow is pretty white. He says, this is a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven has fled away. He says, and there was found no place for them. And they couldn't find a hiding place. In other words, there's no place to hide from the Most High. You can't hide from him. He says, and I saw the dead, small and great, and people of the past who died, standing before Yah here. And the books were open. Notice that plurality of books, not just one book, but books. I don't know if they're categorized in, in people's sins or time periods or generations we'll find out when that day comes but he says and another book was opened which is the book of life now notice this this is after the first resurrection 
over a thousand years or about a thousand years afterwards. So it's the first resurrection is the is not the resurrection to end all resurrections, you know, for eternal life that is. So this first human life beforehand is not the only opportunity for human life. So this is a book of life that will continue for humans after the first resurrection. And it says here, and the dead were judged according not to their faith. And what faith were you? when you were alive in the flesh, but according to their works, their actions, their deeds, their character. And so by the things which were written in those books, the things that were recorded on us, everything that was said and done, that was important for it to be written in those books. Verse 13, it says, then the sea, the waters, not just uh, probably the salt water, you know, but the sea, the waters that everyone who died and drowned, everyone who's in them were in it, Death and Hades were delivered up, the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. So not just, you know, resurrected from the earth, who had been buried and dead, and, and even those who have been cremated. He has the power to resurrect everyone. We're going to get into this in this playlist series here. But going on to this verse here, it says, And they were judged, each one according to his works. Verse 14, Then, Death and Hades were cast into this lake of fire. So death, and we'll cover this, this terminology here in a little bit, which is the second death. So there's a second death. Is, and anyone, and we have to remember, this is post-first resurrection, about a thousand years afterwards. And so it's not referring to everyone. He says, but anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is evaluating people's, their, their human lifespan that they had. How long did they live? What, what did they do? What did they decide? What kind of character did they have? What was their belief? And what, what did they do with what they had to do with, in other words? But there's no explicit wording here. I'd like to you know, call this out for us to remember also and notice there's no explicit wording to resurrect or to awaken everybody to be conscious, the dead to consciousness. Unless their name is written in the book of life, it's obvious that they'll be resurrected to consciousness, we can see here. But the dead, this is referring to the post messianic millennium, and I'm it's going to lead to hope as I expound upon these scriptures and some others through this playlist series. So let's break down these key points from this text I just read from, the post-millennium resurrections. Uh, verse 12, the dead are standing. Now, dead standing, shall we take this literally, that they're conscious when they're standing? It says they're dead. Dead is like a sleep mode. But they're standing. What, what can be the symbolic meaning of standing? But it doesn't refer to them being conscious necessarily. That's a, it's an assumption that's easy to come to is to say that they're conscious. But it says that they're dead. And then the books, as I mentioned, are plural. There's not just one book as a record of dead people's actions, their works. And then there's this other book mentioned that's post First resurrection. So there's book of life, an opportunity for humans to have eternal life even after the first resurrection when the Messiah returns and the dead will meet him in the air. And also we see that the dead were judged. So there's this a discernment, decisions made about them according to their works, but it does not say that they were resurrected to a consciousness, not a literal consciousness yet. At least there's no evidence of that yet. It, it could be an assumption and a conclusion that, that we can draw from this, yes, but not enough evidence that they're awakened yet. Then the sea and Hades. Hades is referring to the earth, those who are dead in the earth who return, return back to dust. He says they were delivered up. And this sounds like a resurrection here. The first resurrection, it says it's a literal resurrection, as we read in previous verses in part one, I addressed of the beginning chapter 20 of Revelation for the first resurrection. But here it just talks about the dead and them being delivered up for a final judgment. And what I propose and the way I understand these scriptures is to include an acceptable time period of a second lifespan. 
human lifespan, to be in the flesh, to have an opportunity, because they didn't have a good enough opportunity, if I may put it that way, for their first human lifespan, an opportunity for some, not everyone who's resurrected, I'm not saying that either, but this is going to be important for us to understand that there's another possible way of interpreting this that is compliant with all the scriptures and the holy day to be a great, wonderful white throne judgment, not just a mean creator and Messiah being judgmental and condemning everyone for this torture and excruciating death or tortured in hell for all eternity, or however people interpret these allegories. But what I propose, perhaps judged, these people are judged while they're still dead. They're still slow, soul sleeping as an allegoric, metaphoric interpretation is the way I take it. Before or with this post-millennium resurrection. There's also Abraham's bosom I'm going to cover in a future in another playlist separate from this. That's an allegory. It's not hyper-literal. And how do we understand that? That's referring to people who have died until the resurrections come. So that's a little uh, teaser for the future here, a little heads up. But notice verse 14. It says, then death and Hades, this is talking about those who are soul sleeping, were cast into a lake of fire. So they're not really conscious if they're dead. They're, they're cast into there. If they're decided that's where they go, that's where they're going to go. They had the, they had an opportunity. They rejected it. If they if they consciously sold their sold <laughs> sold their soul to the devil to be a, a top musician or the best pol politician or whatever they could be in their lifetime, if they consciously said, "I don't care what the Creator says of of everything. I want to do what the adversary says," and how, the, if he calls himself a light bringer, a Lucifer, or whatever he calls himself to get people to make, I can't make those decisions. He will, These and the saints will judge the earth someday. They will be part of judging with the Messiah these, these matters in the future, but I can't say so for right now. Not enough has been revealed to me, but what I can say, what I can see is that we're not talking about a cruel creator. It's not very cruel for him to extinguish unconscious souls, people who knew better and rejected it. They're going to be given a judgment for this time period of burning their the spirit that's unconscious at the time into this lake of fire. And they were human beings once, but their spirits, I'm going to talk about that as well, their spirits going upward in Ecclesiastes, and, and they're stored somewhere like we call it Abraham's bosom. But let's move on to my next slide here. All the dead, this is talking about humans, go to the same place. And their spirits go upward. Their physical bodies go to the same place, so to speak. But their their spirit that's in man, in humanity, let me put it that way, women are included, of course, is going going to go upward and stored somewhere in an unconscious mode. It's also known as soul sleeping here. But notice this in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 20 and 21 verses. It says, all go to one place, all from the dust, and all return to the dust. You know, this is referring to our, our physical bodies are going to basically be extinguished. Verse 21, he says, who knows the spirit of the sons of human beings, which goes upward. So this is our spirits do go upward. But he talks about the spirit and the animals. This is talking about the animal's physical body. And its personality goes downward to the earth. Now, it does not say that the human spirits go up to heaven and that they're conscious. There's no evidence here to show that they're going up to heaven. That's the way some people interpret that. But I, again, look at the allegory of Abraham's bosom, expressing this the best for the dead while they're soul sleeping and, and that there's going to be a future judgment. And I'll cover that in another video of this playlist, as I said. But moving on to 1 Corinthians chapter 2.11 here, it says, For what human knows the things of a human except for the spirit of the humanity that we have as humans? That is in him. Now, we have to understand that 
Greek and Hebrew and a lot of these European languages, these Romance languages as we call them, are masculine feminine. So when the masculine is chosen, it's including feminine when, when there's females involved. So I think we all understand that at this point. So I just want to do say that before, you know, in case there's anyone out there that's not familiar with uh, the languages and some of these modern translations will say humanity or humans or people, as I do often when I'm reading it. So as we understand that, but it's important to understand that from this slide that, that our spirits go someplace when we die, go upward, and referring to our creators got a plan for them, for all humans who do die before this resurrection from the dead that's coming in the future. So there's scriptures about hell and Abraham's bosom that are allegories. They're not hyper literal the way I understand them. <clears throat> Just like parables. If we take them hyper literally, there's a danger to that. If we take the Bible too hyper literally in many topics, we can come up with a flatter earth and, and other ideas that people come up to by hyper literal interpretations of the scripture. So we have to be careful and weary of that. But resurrections from the dead standing, I also propose, are not hyper literal, that they're not literally standing. So why not? Why not say that they're resurrected, that, that they're awakened to stand before him? There's no wording like that in Revelation chapter 20. It says that, you know, it basically says the dead people are, if we understand them as soul sleeping, they're not consciously awake while they're standing. They're not conscious to hear what's going on, what's being said about them. They're dead, but they're standing. So we have to understand that when they're standing, standing is symbolic for judgment of uh, determination of the person's character, of their personality, as, as we will all either stand before him, either upright, or we'll, we'll not be upright, of course. We could be hunched over like a hunchback, and we're not upright. We're kind of poor posture, poor character. And so there's a lot of metaphoric terminology. As it says in the book of Luke, chapter 21, verse 34, Watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape these things to come. This is referring to things to come in the future. And to stand before the Son of Man. And we're going to stand before the Messiah. We're going to stand before him someday. And it will be conscious when we stand before him, especially if we're righteous. But maybe not necessarily if if we are not going to be given a second chance if we really blew it with our first chance uh, or we'll have an opportunity we didn't know better yes there is uh, more than one possible interpretation as i say room for possible interpretations with all due respect but would a loving yah resurrect condemned people People that were just so evil and to tell them just how evil their dirty deeds were and, and they, while they were deceived and didn't know better than and to send their conscious souls to be tortured and to be burned alive. Okay, I'm going to just tell you how bad you were and burn you and torture you. Would a loving Yah do that? It sure, sure sounds like a mean Yah. So a lot of the conclusions here is to understand, as we know him and his character, he's always been loving. He's always been a merciful. Grace has been in there with Torah right from the beginning, as those of us who understand it more accurately and walk in it more accurately and still slip up and make mistakes along the way. That grace has been there it was there even with king david boy he would have been stoned for some of the things he did uh, and but we know that there's grace and that our creator considers our life and what we've done and our intentions our motives how deceived we were at the time did did we have a, a good witness two or three witnesses before we get the final condemnation judgment so forth he knows all those things and and that's why we got to be careful not to judge others while we're human beings let him be that kind of judge. So why resurrect anyone to awaken to, to consciousness, if I may put it that way, unless they have that gift that many of us are given today, that this awakening is growing in these end times, to have a second chance in the future, those who don't have the opportunity that we might have today, to have a second chance with a human life or a lifespan, as I may put it that way.
with salvation, opportunity eventually for everyone. Yes, this is what I propose, either in their first human life opportunity. If not, then there'll be a second one. Every human being, to put it in a nutshell, will have at least a day of revelation, of awakening as an opportunity that the Ruach HaChodesh, that set-apart spirit, don't blaspheme that, but if you blaspheme the Father or the Son and you're deceived when you do it, well, then you can be forgiven, but you can't blaspheme truth that is being given to you and you can't consciously reject that. That's, I'll have a playlist video on the unpardonable sin. What is that? To understand that, why can you blaspheme the Father and the Messiah, but not the Holy Spirit, not the Ruach HaKodesh? And if you understand it from a Trinitarian point of view, you're going to miss the boat because that third person that they say, that the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, is not a person. It's an essence of Yah. It's Him, yes. It is Yah, but it's not a third person. And we have to understand it's the spirit of truth, of revelation, of uh, something being given to you, and you are held accountable for that. That's going to be important to understand as well. So to receive this gift, it's a free gift, and we don't just earn it. Every human being will have this opportunity, not that they've earned it. No one's really earned it, really. We've all sinned and fall short of that glory. But we're all going to have this opportunity with this free gift of eternal life, as we also call it salvation. Most humans, as we'll see in this grand picture of salvation, will have a second human life opportunity to accept or reject the way when the Spirit is really awakening you to it, which leads to eternal life. And as long as we have life and breath, we have opportunity to repent of our sins. Uh, think about the bad stuff King David has done, and he's going to be in the kingdom and should have known better. So there's a lot of people here, most of Jewry, as we say, the Jewish people who say, ah, that Jesus, and they reject him. They never accepted the New Testament Messiah. Yes, they are going to be having an opportunity. I should have a, a video on Ezekiel 37, the awakening to dry bones. To accept or reject the way, as the scriptures refer to it as, the way that leads to eternal life. It talks about repentance. You have to have Torah. You have to have Messiah. But this will include everyone. And if you've accepted that and you've committed sins, you repent. As long as we have life and breath, we can repent. We have the blood. We can be forgiven if we have the right heart, like King David, who should have known better, made some big uh, big mistakes, big sins in his life that, that haunted him as long as he was a human being of guilt. And, and so we may have that as well, but let's repent and focus on the eternal life. Regardless of the penalties we have to suffer in the human life for our sins, we can repent. And this is referring to most of the Jewish people. We say Jewry, uh, most of Christianity, uh, maybe, perhaps, even. You know, it's more than just accepting his name verbally or emotionally. But and, and the Islamic people, the Arabs, the atheists, the, the Buddhists, the Hindus, the people who, who have not had that opportunity of the awakening. And so we have to understand that no one can come to him unless he draws them. So if he's not drawn them, how can they be held accountable? So I'm going to address that in some future video teachings as well to really try to understand that he is a wonderful, loving Yah. No partiality with him. He's going to give everybody a, a good opportunity to accept or reject, which offers the potential for everyone to have a second human life if they have not been resurrected in that first resurrection uh, which there is no second death, but the post that post-millennium resurrection, there's going to be a, a potential of a second human life, which also leaves a possibility for a second death. If they don't get the second opportunity, the second chance right, then as it's clearly mentioned in Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, chapter 20, verses 6, and in verse 14, and in chapter 21, verse 8, talks about this second death so there has to be a second life a second human life to have a second human death this is what really sticks into the context and part of the playlist of this post messianic millennium hope
Yes, this grand finale, as we may put it, of the seven annual Shabbaton, Holy Rest Days, offers a day, opportunity of salvation for eternal life, for the opportunity of every human being who did not receive this gift during their first human life experience, or they had the opportunity and they knowingly rejected it. Uh, that's up for him to decide, of course, knowing all the hearts and minds better than any of us. But the deceived sinners, the humans, who were not yet enlightened as the first fruits, did they receive this during their first and only human opportunity? This is what the judgment is about and deciding upon. <clears throat> Which leads to part three of this playlist titled Post-Messianic Millennium Hope. As I will title something like A Day for Salvation. Because A Day can uh, be more than 24 hours in case you didn't know. And I'll get into that for the next video teaching. As many of you know from the scriptures, A Day can be a lot more than 24 hours. It can be even less than 24 hours. And there's a lot of different ways to interpret a day from the scriptures. I'll get into that in the next video teaching as well and to understand this. So please, if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel yet, please do so you can have easy access to future uploaded videos as well as my past videos and quickly get caught up on anything in this playlist series that you haven't seen yet and hopefully the ones that will be coming soon to be notified. Yah willing.